turn it over. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Kevin Kelly. He's here to um, lead us all in a very active workshop redesigning equitable online assignments from back to front. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Kevin, thank you. Thank you so much and hi everybody. I'm so pleased to be here at the SUNY Online Summit for 2022. It is gonna be a fast paced uh, workshop, but I know that you're up for it. It's only 8 a.m. out here, but you all have had plenty of coffee and are ready to go, I'm pretty sure. You've already been introducing yourself in the chat, but if you haven't done so yet, I use hashtags all throughout my uh, sessions so that I can create a chat summary. So um, if you haven't introduced yourself, use the hashtag hello, and then say who you are and how you're doing. And in, as Alex mentioned, what's your role? Where are you? Um, that's perfect. And you can see in the chat, the, the link to the slides and the handouts that we'll be using. So um, I recently worked with Todd Zakrajek from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and we put together a book about online teaching, and we looked at online teaching through three different lenses. Universal design for learning, a framework that I created when I did some work with a community college district in Oakland, California, that I called the design for learning equity framework, and then last, human connectedness, the what keeps us all together, remembering that there's a human at the other end of the internet connection. So the, for those of you who are familiar with Universal Design for Learning, this will be um, something that you probably know and love. It is their one page handout with guidelines for their three principles, multiple means of supporting student success, creating multiple pathways for students to succeed in your classes, whether that be with engagement, with representation or action and expression. And you can see that they've got lots of little um, checkpoints, they call them, that give you concrete ideas about how to support students where they are. When I did that research for the Peralta Community College District in Oakland, I ended up seeing a lot of parallels that were less about um, accessibility and more about equity. So I created a similar three by three grid that would allow us to um, view through multiple lenses, a little bit like when you're at the eye doctor and they put multiple lenses down in front of your eyes. Is it clearer now? Is it fuzzier? Is it the same? And so you can see um, that we're gonna look at access, connection and belonging for three aspects of the teaching and learning process, engagement, content review, and assessment. And we'll dive into each of these in more depth as we go. And last but not least, that human connection. We know that students, especially during the pandemic, were craving uh, the ability to connect with their classmates. I think it was on the order of almost 80% in the surveys that were going around said the thing they missed the most was their connection to their classmates and to their instructors. So as I mentioned, if we look at uh, our courses through these different lenses, um, then we can end up with um, making it a richer and more equitable experience for our students. One thing that I'll um, mention as a caution is that I am going to be describing a number of strategies. Uh, I usually refer to it as a buffet. And those strategies are examples of ways that we can make our courses more equ equitable, but they're not meant to be a checklist or a prescription. Instead, we want to start thinking uh, about adopting equity-focused online teaching mindsets where you're getting to know your students and their needs. And these examples that I'll give are um, ways that we can execute that. All right. So... We're gonna blaze through and you all hopefully are ready. We're gonna do four 20 minute micro workshops um, and then we're gonna close with some Q and A and such. Um, but I wanna make sure that everybody has the um, handouts. And so we'll pop those in the chat one more time for people who might've just jumped in. It's a tiny CC link. And then I'm gonna set my timer so that we stay on track. 
So again, we're gonna follow the backward design model. And so we'll look at assessment first, uh, how we help asking students to show what they know. Then we'll look at engagement, uh, how are we asking in the learners to engage with each other and us uh, as they go through the preparations for those assessments. The content review, what are we, how are we pre preparing students to get ready for all of the activities and assessments? And then the last thing that often doesn't get covered, uh, instructions. How do we create equity-focused assignment instructions? So that's what we'll cover today. And as we go, be sure to pop any questions in the chat. And if it's related to what we're discussing at that moment, um, I'll answer it. And then if it's something that we can save for the next micro workshop, we'll do that. All right, so let's take a look at assessment. And thanks, Aaron, for putting the link to the slides and handouts in the chat. All right, so when we look at that three by three grid that I created, the design for learning equity framework, the first top left corner is looking at assessment um, in terms of access. And that translates into achievement pathways. And so some examples of how we can create achievement pathways include providing just in time inline links to the appropriate support in the instructions for your assessment so that if students may be returning students and they need help learning how to use the technologies required to complete the assignment, or maybe the second bullet, providing alternative technology paths for students to de demonstrate achievement. They may be forced to use a mobile device and may not be able to complete certain tasks in the traditional way. So is there an alternative way for them to show what they know? Last one more bullet, and this is not an exhaustive list. It's just a couple as an example. We can make strides to manage cultural bias that might be that we might not be aware of in our assessments or our activities. So let's take a look at some of these in more depth. And then I want to pick your brains. What are you doing in your classes? So when I talk about adaptation pathways, um, you can see here um, the, exa the example I gave before of a student who might be using their mobile device as their primary or their only way to complete your course assignments and, and assessments. I ended up um, giving uh, my students back in 2008, early on in the online days, I asked them all to start saving their files as PDF files because I couldn't open some of the things they were turning in. <laughs> they were turning in Apple pages and open document formats and all these different things. And I didn't have all those programs. And so I said, hey, use whatever you want to create your essays and your assignments for this class, but please save them as a PDF so I can open them. And then I immediately got an email from one of my students. He said, I'm so sorry to bother you, uh, instructor, but uh, right now I'm living in my car and I don't have a computer. I'm just using my cell phone. Your class is called How to Learn with Your Mobile Device. And so I thought I would be able to do all the work from my phone. How do I save things as a PDF? And I said, oh my gosh, I just created an equity barrier for my own students. And so I went back out and I said, stop the presses turn in whatever you have, doesn't matter, I'll figure it out. And for this particular student, I said, well, instead of Microsoft Word, you can use a Google Doc. If you don't wanna to have to type an entire essay with your thumbs, there's an app called Dragon Naturally Speaking where you can basically recite your essay and it will turn it into text that you can edit. Um, now I've even gone even farther. Uh, I wish I had thought of it when, when he was my student. I create a Google Voice uh, account that's a free phone number that uh, I can check the voicemail and he can write his essay with pen and paper and then read it as a voicemail message. And I can grade it with the same rubric that I use for everybody else. And so starting to think about how we can support students where they are. If you're a STEM teacher and the student may not have a computer, you can see the bottom right picture shows calculus um, problems, integrals being done on paper and just taking a picture of those um, problem sets if they want to get help from a TA or an instructor is another way to go. And in service learning, right now, uh, we've been out here in California, we've been doing a lot of workshops around virtual service learning opportunities to make sure that students are still able to engage with their communities, even if they can't do so in person. 
when we talk about um, providing students with opportunities to submit things in multiple formats, what I've done for my final project is they write a draft essay or an outline answering all the question prompts. And I make them do that first because sometimes the end result can be a little unwieldy. Then I give them a choice. What do you want this to become, this draft essay or outline that you've created? Do you want it to be in a text format, a presentation, something that's audio or video, multimedia? You pick. I'm going to use the same rubric to evaluate it, and you're going to turn in your draft essay with that final format. And this provides students with opportunities to play with digital literacy, but also gives them an opportunity to turn things in if they have limited technology capabilities. So now it's your turn. With respect to assessment, how do you or do you want to increase access in your assignments? Now use the hashtag access again so that we can um, start managing the chat summary. Uh, and then you can use some secondary hashtags, support that you're going to show students where to find it, technology, you're going to give them alternative pathways to do their work, bias, you're going to be looking at your multiple choice questions that come from the publisher to see if they're written in ways that might be biased against students who are international students or students who are English as a second or other language. Um, so share the ways that you are currently increasing access in your assignments or uh, that you want to. And Lori got us started she's doing performance-based assignments and collaborative assignments to increase access. Who else out there has got some interesting ideas? Corinne says, uh, teaching technology yes, uh, such as Google Docs built into cita citation managers and speech to text. Those are good and we'll talk about those more when we get to content review as well. Dr. Tom says one-on-one -on -one virtual meetings, nice, as a way to support the students. Take one or two more and then we'll make sure we scrape this chat and create a Google Doc for everyone later. Michelle says, I let go of strict sense when tests are open. The midterm is open right away so students can take their time, ask questions, and does the same with the final. Great. So keep those ideas coming, and I will um, move on to the next subtopic. So when we look at assessment through the lens of connection, that can mean um, different ways of providing feedback to students. And so one might be using different media for us as instructors to give feedback to students. And we know that there are some studies out there that show that students may actually incorporate the feedback and make modifications to the way they turn in their work if they get that feedback via video or audio versus text. Uh, and there's only a couple studies, so I don't consider that to be um, uh, the final word, <laughs> but it is something worth investigating. Providing opportunities for students to give each other peer review is another way to increase their sense of connection with their fellow students and um, providing meaningful prompts for students to give each other feedback that respects diversity. Often the prompts that we give students are very simple. Um, I want you to answer my post and here's a paragraph of instructions on how to do that. And then reply to two other students, period. And so that reply to two other students needs a little more depth if we want students to give each other comprehensive feedback and if we want them to do it in a way that respects diversity. So let's take a look at some of these in more depth. I mentioned earlier that the feed, the using video to give virtual feedback, and here's one of the studies I was talking about. Um, is a way to increase that sense of connection with students. Some instructors will use a screencast and just um, bring up the student's work, whether it be a math problem or an essay or a case study or you name it. Um, and you can walk through the uh, assignment and give verbal feedback about how they did and what they could do differently next time. 
You can also refer to students' personal goals. So if you've done some sort of survey, if you've asked them to submit some sort of brief bio of what their personal goals are, their academic goals, their professional goals, then you can refer to those when you give them their feedback. If you know someone wants to go into healthcare, then you can say, hey, this particular skill that you're demonstrating is going to really help you when you get into that environment. Last, including examples of what and how students can improve the assignment so that they can um, do better on the next one or turn that one back in. You can see Michelle in the chat just said she uses coaching language for the feedback. We also wanna give students multiple opportunities. If we have any researchers in the room, you're probably familiar with the idea of triangulation, right? And that means that we're, not expecting one study to explain the world. We're gonna use multiple studies to kind of get closer and closer to different parts of the truth. So when we ask our students to show what they know, why would we only give them one opportunity to do that and a high stakes opportunity at that? So if we wanna be more equitable, we can break it up. In my class, I have five big topics and I break them into three week modules. You can see in week one, I have some recorded mini lectures and they take some quizzes. Low stakes, um, not as difficult, but some people aren't as um, fond of multiple choice uh, quizzes. They also do something at a higher level. They take one idea that they learned from the mini lectures and they create a plan. I'm gonna try this for two weeks and then I'm gonna see how it goes and in my own life. In week two, they do group discussions, kind of a middle level of difficulty or challenge. Universal Design for Learning would tell us we wanna provide different levels of challenge. And then in week three, we have them summarize those group discussions together and then write a reflection on how their personal exploration went. That thing that they said they wanted to try for two weeks, how did it go? And so you can see here, I've got five different opportunities using quizzes, discussions, a couple of different essays that involve going out into the world and coming back and reporting uh, so that I get a better picture of if students are reaching the learning outcomes for the class. When we think about the prompts that we ask students to um, respond to in our assessments and sometimes in our activities, which we'll cover later, we can encourage the interchange of differing viewpoints. We can ask students to view course concepts from the perspective of different groups. And we can ask students to tie the assignment to their own personal values. And so these are different ways that we can create a greater sense of connection just through the prompts of our assign ass assessments. So I'll turn it back to you again. How will you or do you already increase connection in your assignments? Do you um, humanize the feedback? Do you give them peer review opportunities? Do you have comprehensive prompts? Uh, that you have them uh, use to make sense of your assessments? W what are your strategies? Corinne gives video feedback with paper comments, a Zoom link and a Word doc and a transcript self-assessment opportunities where students compare their own work throughout. There's three peer review assignments, prompts and rubrics share, shared from day one. You're a person after my own heart, Corinne. Thank you for sharing that. Robert says he gives formative feedback. Bethany, self and peer assessments. Laura, both constructive and recognizing what they've done well in the feedback. Students really responded to video feedback, Susan says. Peer assessed their own blog and discussion post with the rubrics so they can learn how to apply the rubrics for their own work. Perfect. Jennifer, grading rubrics, peer reviews to increase connection. So you all are doing amazing things. And again, keep popping those in the chat. I see Simone is using ungraded works as well as graded works. And I'm gonna move to the last section of our assessment part of the program. So when we combine assessment with belonging, we can look at the concept of persistence. And often that can be after the course, uh, but it, 
it could be in the course, it could be at the institution where you are, in the discipline that you're instructing. Um, so really, how can we increase student sense of belonging locally and globally at the same time? What are some strategies? One is to, and we've seen some chat comments to this effect, at what, to what extent are these works that your students producing visible? Uh, if you want to keep it as a one-on-one -on -one connection, you are giving individual feedback to students, then obviously we can use the assignment tool in the learning management system, or in some cases, if they're large files and such, you might use Dropbox or some other means for students to share their work with you. But if you're trying to create that sense of belonging where they're working in teams, if you want them to make connections to students in the entire class, or if you want them to interact with the whole world, then you might use for those teams or the entire class learning management system tools like discussions, wikis, or group pages. But if you want the whole world to give feedback to those students, then you might end up using online galleries like Flickr, um, and Derek Bruff has some great examples of uh, basically students going out into the world, taking pictures and sharing all their pictures in one virtual space. Um, he's from Vanderbilt. If you haven't heard of Derek Bruff, check him out. Um, you might have not just individual student portfolios, but a class portfolio so that they feel like they're part of the whole community, the learning community that you're creating. And you might use collaborative tools like Google Docs or VoiceThread so that they can um, continue working together. I see uh, Bancha got Bruff's book for Christmas. That's a good gift, even if you gave it to yourself. So what are some strategies that you use to increase belonging in your assignments at the course level, the institution level, or the discipline level? We know right now we're focus with the challenge of how do we make sure that students of color, women are um, given the opportunity to excel in fields where they're not typically uh, represented like STEM or other fields. And so love to see what your strategies are for increasing students' sense of belonging at different levels. We see a team system in class, discussions, class portfolio for tutoring. Oh, Michelle uses the transparency in learning and teaching framework, the TILT framework, which I'm gonna bring up later. So hang on to your hat, Michelle. You're one of my tribe. Je Jeannie uses Slack and within the Slack group, um, hashtags and also let them create their own channels for things that might not be related to the class, pets, sports, and specific topics, nice. So keep those ideas coming and I'm going to move us to the next section. We'll take a brief break if you, because this is 90 minutes long. Some people like to get up and stretch. I know um, sitting for 90 minutes can be a long period and I can answer a question while you do that. Maybe get a sip of tea as this young lady is doing. Parallel to belonging, do you see a connection between student control of learning and feeling of belonging? Well, Susan, the, I do know motivation is increased when they feel they belong, uh, but in terms of student control of learning, uh, that's a good question. And we can throw that out to the group if anyone's seen any studies or has anecdotes from their own course about the connection between more control students have and the sense of belonging they feel. I do think, Susan, that if we think in the assessment realm, which we've just been talking about, there is a connection if you're giving students a, a control of maybe the topic uh, for a particular activity. And so then they feel like they belong because they're not doing some 
checkbox activity to show they know how to do research, they're doing research that will inform their community, their family, their neighbors. And so I, I'm going to go back and what I said, I think there is, <laughs> it can be a connection between student control of learning and feeling of belonging. And it just depends on where you're giving them the control. Roberta says calling students by name and acknowledges that I'm doing that right now. Great. All right, well, because it's 825 in my end of the country and 1125 in New York and some different times in between, it's time to move to micro workshop number two. So again, if you don't have it downloaded, go to that handy dandy Google Drive tiny.cc link and Christine is Christine on the spot. She just popped it up there like it was magic. Uh, but that's where you can get the handouts. Uh, and because you're popping the stuff in the chat, but you may want to keep notes for yourself as well, right? So we're going to talk in this micro workshop about increasing learning equity during, during the interactions that we have around our assignments. And that might be more in-depth uh, focus on peer review, some teacher-student feedback, or just activities that prepare students to do well on the assessments. Let's take a look. So again, looking at that design for learning equity framework that I presented at the front of the session, when we cross engagement with access, we're humanizing the environment the students are in. So that might mean a couple different things. And these, again, are not exhaustive. One is we can establish our own presence. Now, many of you might be familiar with the community of inquiry model, where we have a teaching presence, a social presence, a cognitive presence. That teaching presence is so important for students to stay motivated. If they don't feel that you're paying attention to their work, um, what's the value? Another way to express or promote value is to show that diversity is valued so that you don't want the same thinking in every paper that you don't want the same perspectives, whether those perspectives be from life experience, from different cultural backgrounds, from different identities, and how can we manage implicit bias to prevent students from feeling um, excluded. So when we have our activities in our course, right, we can address diversity by thinking about let's say you have a small group um, sharing the research on the impact of diversity on group success. And I usually share the New York Times article by Charles Duhigg, where he did the study for Google that uh, identified what makes a successful team. And that helps students who aren't used to working in small groups or who don't like to work in small groups because they have bad experiences in the past. And they know the factors that make the group successful are as diverse and of ideas as possible. And that diversity, again, can be life experience. It can be age. It can be um, what their major is. It can be their ethnicity, their culture, but also the psychological safety to participate because that research shows that the groups that had more consistent and equivalent contributions from the entire team did better. The teams that led one or two people lead the show ended up not doing as well, even though they had some strong players. That's why out here in California, the Warriors don't always win, even when Steph Curry is draining threes and making 50 points a game. Also, we need to address the value of diversity of thinking when engaging and communicating about an assignment. So we want to promote it and we can put it right in the instructions for our activities, right? Then we need to think about bias. So there's a great book by Jennifer Eberhardt about bias and she says, hey, everybody's got it, but the important thing is that we are aware of it and that we manage it. So I'm a fan of the website at Yale, their Center for Teaching and Learning talks about exploring what potential biases and assumptions we might be making and getting out in front of them. One bias they um, point out that might seem intuitive, the bias that we might assume stu students know to go look for help when they're struggling. But when I just attended last year, uh, 
panel of students put on by the California Community College Student Senate. They were saying very clearly, the students who need the help the most are the least likely to go look for it because the stigma, because they don't, they, they may be first generation students and don't know the protocols for approaching the teacher or the support network. And in a time when they may be forced to take classes online uh, that they didn't choose to do so, they may not know how to get virtual support from the campus. Uh, if they're given a phone number, but they can't call because they're working, uh, they have challenges. So we need to get out in front of that and help students by giving them the support they need and the pathways to get the support, even if it's not a traditional pathway. We also want to solicit feedback from our students and our colleagues about um, instructions if you might show evidence of bias and working with the students at the beginning of each term to create class engagement norms so that we can um, address potential biases right at the beginning as a group. Simone brings up also fear of perpetuating the affirmative action stereotype, right? So um, there are different ways that we can manage these implicit biases and I look forward to seeing more of your ideas in the chat. So uh, with that said, <laughs> tell me how you already increase access in the engagement parts of your class through increasing your presence, fostering a sense of value uh, around diversity, managing implicit bias or anything else. Uh, go ahead and share what you're doing in your class. And Alex has put some great links in the chat, one being the Yale Center Implicit Bias Awareness Test, and then also the book that I mentioned, Biased by Jennifer Everhart. Thank you so much. Michelle manages implicit bias by grading anonymous, anonymously. And I'm guessing that you mean that you remove the names from the papers before you grade them. Pam has a bias checklist developed for use by faculty at Upstate. And so there's a link there and we'll make sure we put that in our chat summary as well. Thank you, Pam. And it's okay if you aren't doing all of these things in your class, you can also put something that you would like to try. Even if you're not sure of the strategy, you can say, I wanna increase my presence to support student engagement, or I need to learn more about implicit bias. Laura says, posting frequent announcements to increase the sense of teacher presence, right? I use a Monday, Wednesday, Friday strategy, Monday to kick off the class, Wednesday, as I call it, the midweek motivation, where it's more um, take a look at these great posts in the discussion to encourage students who haven't joined the discussion yet. And Friday is a weekend um, wrap up. What, what's going to be due next, next Monday? I do a start on Monday and an end on Monday. So students have eight days to do the work because the Beatles said there are eight days in a week, right? Okay. Susan says, I don't know if this fits here, but praising the work and not the individual. So that's very growth mindset, right? Praising effort. Saying this work is top notch instead of saying you're a good student. Not sure if that addresses bias. Well, Susan, uh, I, I think it's, it's a powerful activity. We'll talk a little bit about growth mindset in a little bit. I've got some uh, ideas about that and whether or not it addresses bias. Um, we as instructors may be biased toward uh, talent or ability. And so by praising the effort, we are um, definitely managing some forms of bias for sure. Brandon randomly assigns groups for group work. Michelle includes materials from different cultural perspectives. Awesome. We're going to cover that when we get to content review, but that's a perfect example. Worry calls students by name when grading their works on Blackboard and highlight their outstanding points on their posts, right, absolutely calling up the great ideas. And I try to keep a list of who I'm highlighting so that I'm highlighting as many people as I can 
across the entire semester. And Caitlin, little hashtag correction, explicitly naming bias in our discipline and providing alternative materials. And Caitlin, sometimes we can even engage students in that conversation, right? We can say, hey, I feel like this uh, textbook doesn't show women of color in leadership roles. Let's go find some pictures and share them with the publisher and encourage them to do a better job. Nice, so let's move on here. When we think of engagement and crossing it with connection, then we're thinking about that social learning. We are humans, we are social learners. So again, some a small number of examples include requiring interactions that student among students that are designed to deepen their learning through those interactions and also strengthen the connections to their classmates. We can also manage another type of bias called interaction bias that I'll talk about in a second. And we can connect students to the appropriate resources and services at a distance. That connection can be to the support services that our campus offers. So when we look at inclusive engagement strategies, uh, my colleague, Kimberly Tanner at San Francisco State, she's in biology and wrote a great article a few years ago now, but I think that it still stands the test of time because she's got fantastic strategies about inclusivity when it comes to engagement. And so giving students time to think and talk about course topics. So activities like think, pair, share allow us to do that. Encouraging or demanding participation by all students. So we can have some different activities like assigning reporters for small groups that rotate, building an inclusive community for all students. So exactly as we saw from uh, Caitlin about naming bias in our discipline. We can also call out the lack of diversity in our discipline. We can, or in the materials or what have you. So we can make it an active conversation and pull in other voices that would increase the diversity. Hey, I want you to hear from um, people who represent you. you. My class at San Francisco State, just like SUNY, very diverse group of students. I think San Francisco State has 108 languages other than English spoken at home. And so I know that uh, I need to be very aware of as many different ways of presenting the material, engaging students with people um, that will become models for them. And we can monitor our own and our students' behavior. Again, we saw in that assessment earlier, establishing norms with our students. So, um, we talked about implicit bias earlier. Now we're going to talk about interaction bias. And this study out of Stanford a couple of years ago showed that in online discussion forums, based on student names alone, the online teachers are 94% more likely to reply to white male student names than to other students. So when I saw this study, I said, oh my gosh, am I doing that? And so I went, created a Google spreadsheet because I have 50 to 100 students in my class every semester. And I created a column for the student names and a column for every discussion that we have across the semester. And we have usually over 16 weeks, probably around 12 to 15 discussions. And so I would keep track and I would put in my syllabus, hey, I cannot answer every student every week, but it's my goal to make sure that I respond to every student the same amount uh, across the entire semester. And I'm keeping track on a spreadsheet. I wanna make sure you're getting feedback from me as well as your students. My strategy used to be that I would answer the students who had no replies from their students. Now I do that and then I check who haven't I responded to yet in the last week or two. So what are your strategies for increasing students' sense of connection in the engagement activities in your class? Are you creating meaningful prompts? Are you addressing interaction biases? Are you um, giving them links to resources and services, which we'll discuss in micro workshop four, which is about how we can create more equitable instructions for our assignments? What are your strategies?
Maureen contact students directly if they haven't logged in in three to four days and ask if everything's okay. Awesome. And I have found that even changing the subject line of my emails, I used to put my course name, iTech for Instructional Technologies 299. And then I would have something like, don't forget deadline approaching. I, and I thought that that would be something that would encourage them to hop back in the class. Since I've changed to a different approach, I put iTech 299, are you okay? Question mark as the subject for my email. And then I, my first paragraph might be something like, hey, I know it's a busy time of semester. You might have something going on in your life right now. Just want to know that we've noticed that you haven't been in class. We miss you in the discussion. Let me know how I can help you catch up. Uh, that approach of showing caring rather than putting an administrative <laughs> uh, heavy, uh, heavy approach um, has generated probably quintuple the replies. I used to get about 10 to 12% of students reply to my administrative emails, and now I get 65% for um, the one that shows that I'm thinking about them first and then their success in the class as part of that. Michelle uses several modes of communication to reach out, so multiple pathways. I even uh, use remind.com. If any of you are familiar with that, it's a free text messaging service and you can have students sign up to get free texts. And so I just send a tweet sized version of the announcement from my email in case they don't check email as frequently and they can sign up for that, it's opt, opt in. All right, so let's talk about belonging when it comes to our engagement. We can encourage individual participation as we just saw from, um, I think it was, Maureen talked about checking in with students, showing engagement is valued for and by all students and demonstrating caring as I just mentioned. So a couple activities that we can use to increase students sense of connection and belonging. One is a Google Maps icebreaker where they can share stories of meaningful places to them, encouraging them not to put a pin where their house is, but also if you decide that you don't want an activity that will take away from the course topics, you can have students find locations that are meaningful to course topics. Like if you're teaching math, where was the number zero invented? Where was, or pick a location that's important to you and share a math concept that was originated in that particular part of the world. In my own class, I use this what matters to me activity on the right. It's a values affirmation activity where I put a list of 50, five zero values ranging from hard work to uh, family and faith to um, personal growth. And I ask them to pick the top three in their life right now. It can change throughout our lives, but today, what are the top three values that you're uh, working toward? And they write one paragraph that says, how my class helps them live those values or how those values are gonna help them succeed in my class. And that very act increases their sense of connection to the course and increases their internal motivation because they have affirmed that it aligns with their values. Also thinking about universal design for learning, we can use some of their strategies to increase students' sense of belonging. We can scaffold the activities, foster collaboration as we've seen in the chat time and time again, and foster motivation. And you can see um, this set of instructions from one of my activities um, does a couple of those at once. So as we wrap up section two, micro workshop two, share with me please and your colleagues how you increase belonging through engagement or how you want to increase belonging through engagement. And that could be some form of encouragement, um, sharing um, that you value student contributions, um, that you care about their success and that ab about them as people. What are, what are your strategies? Share them in the chat.
Caitlin exhibits caring. My learners are working nurses and have been all throughout the pandemic. And acknowledging and naming this has been an important part of my practice, so important. Maureen asks students to share their strategies for dealing with stress of online learning and point out good examples to their peers. Perfect. Lori says, creating a student-centered learning environment. Michelle, similar in that I teach grief and loss, and there is always ample current events to which I can connect and ask them to connect as well. Those are great. All right, so keep those ideas coming about how you increase belonging in your class when you have activities or engagement. And we're gonna move to a quick stretch break, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. And then we're going to hop into micro workshop number three. So feel free to stand up and listen as I give you an overview of what we're gonna cover here. The ideas that we ask students to consume before they engage in those activities, before they show what they know, often, at least early, as instructors, we can fall into the trap of just saying, here's, here's the reading for the week, or here are some extra articles if you want. But it turns out to be a bullet list, right? Instead of having comprehensive instructions to support first generation students who might not know what to do with those readings, they might need some prompts to help them make sense. What am I supposed to be getting out of this? So how do we scaffold the process? How do we support them? And there are some other aspects to equity related to content review, such as multiple perspectives, which someone shared earlier in the chat, and also cost. If we can, if we find valuable resources, open educational resources that are just as good or better than stuff that students would have to pay for, um, let's do it. So let's take a look at content review with equity in mind. So when we look at the concept of access with respect to content, that word access can mean a couple different things. So do students feel a level of access to the materials because they see themselves in it? So how do we address whether or not the images and media from our class reflect the diversity of the learners in our classroom? How do we manage image and representation bias? How do we help students manage costs with open educational resources or what they call zero textbook cost materials, ZTC? How do we make our course transparent? Somebody mentioned TILT, the Transparency in Learning and Teaching Initiative. How do we create or use accessible course elements? Again, access also includes supporting students with disabilities of different forms, and then mobile friendly formats. So there you can see access can mean a lot of different things when it comes to the content we ask students to consume for our class. It might mean representation, it might mean the format that it's in and, and more. So st supporting students access to content can take different forms. One, the most important that I put on that slide with the caution tape at the beginning is getting to know our students better. So what do they need? Next, thinking about those students who might be um, driving to a McDonald's or Starbucks parking lot to get internet access. I can tell you as recently as last month, I was doing that for conference presentations. I was doing that for big meetings where I couldn't afford to lose connectivity because at my own house, uh, the, the internet connection kept going out. And so I would drive my car to um, Starbucks near my house and sit in the back seat and give a conference presentation or engage in a meeting. And uh, people would nod their heads because they know that adjunct faculty students are doing the same thing. And in some cases, they're doing it where you all are, 19 degrees outside, and they're sitting in their car trying to get the materials for the course. So one strategy we can use to help them is creating download packets. Rather than having big media-heavy files that take a long time to download, let's create 
download packets that are quick to download so they can go offline as soon as they can. Also, if we know that students might be listening instead of watching, how do we use audio cues to make sure that they have uh, the information they need, even if they're only listening to it while they're washing the dishes after putting the kids to bed, let's say. Providing things in more than one format so they have a choice of what they're gonna consume this particular time. Testing what we ask students to consume on a mobile device. What does the print look like? Does it cost money to uh, use the data to, to get a particular material? And then I talked about um, OER, ZTC, and SUNY Coil Center says, don't forget about transcripts. Then when we look at the concept of representation, so we talked about formats and strategies for delivering content, but there is research that shows that students, some students will see less value for learning in materials that don't represent them or include role models for them. And so strategies that we can use to address that type of gap in representation. Um, one is a, is a link that I've put together. It's a list of image galleries that promote diversity uh, and representation. So I'll pop that in the chat for you all. It's another tiny CC link, diverse image galleries. Take a look at that and uh, check it out. But you, again, as we discussed in the chat and uh, in the last section, the last micro workshop, we can also discuss representation in our course materials or in our field with our students, make it an active conversation. I have a colleague who's a sociology instructor. She didn't like the fact that her textbook didn't represent the students in her class in Oakland, California, but it was the best textbook she could find. So she made it an activity, bonus points for students who would write a letter to the publisher saying why it's important to increase the diversity of representation in that textbook. And they all got responses from the publisher committing to making changes to the next edition. So you can make this an interaction with the world activity as well as an awareness generation activity. Last, let's think about accessibility for how we have students consume their content or when they're creating content. So I know for my class, I like to give students opportunities to reply to each other, either in text format or video using Flipgrid. And I use Flipgrid because it generates captions automatically, but I tell them they need to go check those captions first. And so I send them to the tutorial about how to edit their captions to make sure they're accurate. So we can ask students to adopt accessibility practices so it's not all on us, but they also become aware and take that with them to other classes. And we can also provide guidance for people working in breakout groups. How can they support students who might need accommodations? And establishing norms, again, is something that we've covered in every micro workshop. That conversation at the beginning of a class with your students where you're establishing norms about how you're going to interact with one another, you can include accessibility as part of that conversation so that students know that whether or not someone has gone to the disability programs and resource center and signed up, there are people who need different accommodations. I think Microsoft put it at 60 to 65% of the population benefits when we make accommodations for whether it be a caption on a video or uh, some other strategy. Some other things that we can do are practices. So, Let's take a look at our discussion forums. And you can see there are two lists of threads on the left-hand side here. Imagine if you were using a screen reader and it was just reading the names of each thread. On the left, you see synthesis discussion, synthesis discussion, discussion, synthesis, link, synthesis discussion. So you can see that that student would have no idea what any of those discussion forum posts are about. So I asked my students to write a six to 10 word unique title for their thread and their replies to other people's threads. So then when the screen reader hits it, reminders to keep me on track. Wolfram Alpha is the way to exit math class. It's learning about rocks with purple X. You can see that's a lot more concrete. Students know what they're getting into and can um, 
make appropriate choices about what they want to reply to. And we can ask students to discuss the topics in your class from different perspectives, um, whether that be um, something in the news. We had saw that in the chat that um, people can draw from current events um, or uh, stuff related to your course topics. So I'm interested to know how you're increasing access to content review for your classes, whether it be um, through increasing the representation, addressing your material costs, or addressing accessibility. Lori's first out of the gate with providing access to course resources such as videos, labs, and students' slide notes. Enoch says, ask students to review the course content, the textbook, any examples or assignments as a cultural expert and contribute their opinion as an expert reviewer. That's a great activity. Michelle, provide guided lecture notes. And some people are echoing that they like the idea of having students be course content reviewers. As you add more ideas about how you're increasing access to your content, see a couple related to accessibility from Jennifer and Enoch, auto captions and web conferencing. And don't wait until somebody asks, absolutely. So let's take a look at the next, as you all put your ideas in the chat. When we start thinking about content, with respect to connection, we're looking at really diversity and meaning. So we can showcase multiple diverse perspectives on course topics. We can support collaborative content review, and we can support analysis or address harm or impact of stereotypes or misrepresentations. And so I know we saw um, the concept of stereotypes appear in the chat earlier. And Simone even uh, mentions that right now, as we have these multimodal courses like hybrid flexible courses, having recordings of live sessions uh, increases students' access. Great idea, Simone. So earlier I mentioned I was gonna discuss the growth mindset again. And in this particular example in my, from my class, it's a strategy of providing multiple perspectives about growth mindset. So in the early days when I was teaching my class, I would only use um, Carol Dweck and her colleagues work related to growth mindset as a way to help students understand what it is. But as I started growing with um, my intent to increase the diversity of perspectives, I found Luke Wood, my colleague from San Diego State. He has an alternative perspective on mindsets that it's incomplete for students of color. We, want to not only praise effort, but we want to affirm that we feel they have the ability to achieve the goals we've set out. Angela Lee Duckworth describes passion and grit as factors related to growth mindset. And Anindya Kundu talks about student agency and also things that students might feel are out of their control, like socioeconomic influences or circumstances. And so I have them review some TED Talks by these different folks or podcast interviews, and then have a conversation about which perspective informs how they see the growth mindset and what their particular mindset is. Another way we can increase students' sense of connection with each other in the content review context is using collaborative tools. So, if you've seen Hypothesis or eMargin, those are social reading or collaborative annotation tools that allow students to read, highlight, and comment on the same body of text. So that can be a powerful way for students to ask each other questions. For you to start the ball rolling by putting prompts in the text at the end of each 
section of a chapter, let's say, questions that students should consider and answer before they move to the next section. You can do the same thing with audio. Let's say it's a music class and students can give each other feedback about recordings they make. Or let's say it's video. Uh, let's say it's a skills demonstration class like welding or a, a theater arts class or dance, something that you can use to annotate videos so that students can review and comment on each other's work or the work that you've asked students to review for class. Alex mentions that Digo uh, is another collaborative annotation tool, and I like that one as well. Laurie brings up voice threat. So yeah, there's more for sure. So you're already ahead of the game. How are you increasing students' sense of connection through content review for your class? Uh, are you focusing on diversity? Are you giving them collaboration opportunities? Are you addressing stereotypes or misrepresentations? Um, go ahead and share in the chat how you're working on increasing students' connection as they review content for your class. Caitlin uh, asks students to respond to each other's voice thread assignments with text or voice responses. Sometimes you can ask them to do both if you have students who might need one or the other. Simone uses case study assignments to increase collaboration among the students. Maureen, I try to emphasize how the exercises can apply to their everyday lives. For example, car financing, buy or lease, and encourage them to look in their own lives for examples. seeing some great examples of increasing connection. And don't forget, you can also put your goals. If you don't currently feel you're doing it, what would you like to do? Alex says, a discussion area in the course where students can help each other and answer each other's questions. Perfect. Alex, I've done this before with a one minute thread instead of a one minute paper so that students are answering each other's muddiest point, what the things that they don't understand in the class meeting or activity. And where he says, co-creating lesson plans and learning materials to collaborate. All right, so let's cover the last section of our content review, increasing the sense of belonging by introducing a personal context and some of the things that we've been hearing as recently as Maureen's comment about applying to everyday life, connecting the content to students' goals, identities, backgrounds, and we can add experiences, connect content to the backgrounds of others, the way the game Bury Me My Love um, asks students to think about um, the experience of people who are immigrants. And then asking students to make personal connections to the course content or topics. So again, this is stuff that you all are sharing in your chat comments. I really liked this example from Alicia Caballeros at Laney College in Oakland. Even before the pandemic, she would have students um, reviewing content for the class, but in a way that you normally don't see. She would have them watch the same videos as everybody else, but she would ask them to do it in a community setting watch this video about this course topic, maybe around health 
equity with your family, with your friends, with your roommates. And then your activity is to not just watch it with those people, but facilitate a discussion about it. And your, what you write is a synopsis of what came out of that discussion. So you've now created a way to increase the meaning of the content to students' lives by having them talk about them, not with fellow students, but with people in other parts of their life. And so you can see here, she asked for evidence, take pictures, videos, or recordings. Uh, so she can see that they had a group together and you can see the cat on the cat tree is looking at the video just like everybody else. So I'm interested to know how you are increasing belonging through content review in your own class. Are you asking them to pull in their own experiences? Are you exhibiting empathy for particular populations that you might be studying in your class? Are you asking them to tell personal stories? What are your strategies? And again, we're seeing great ideas flying through the chat. All right, well, Roberta starts us off by students share short reflections about their learning with each other. So that increases their sense of belonging. And Robin, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the parentheses in your name. Connecting personal stories and experiences with the theory from class and their weekly reflection. That's a good one, Worry. Maybe one more and then we'll move on to the last of our micro workshops. And I'll encourage you all to take a sip of tea, water, coffee, whatever you've got going. I know it's noon out East Coast, so if you're interested in eating lunch, go for it. And uh, stretch, stand up, sit down, whatever you need to do. And we're going to move on to how do we create equitable instructions for our assignments? Or let's call them equity-focused instructions is a better way to put it. So I'm going to give a nod to someone in the chat talked about Tilt earlier. Um, the transparent assignment template is one of the better known um, artifacts that came out of the transparency and learning and teaching initiative uh, began at University of Nevada, Las Vegas with Marianne Winklemiss and her team. If you haven't heard of the transparent assignment template before, there are three elements to what they share with students. The purpose of your assignment, where you might link to outcomes, list knowledge or skills they'll gain and relate it to their lives. The task that they're gonna perform and you'll include both the process that they should follow and the expectations. And then criteria for success. What are some ways that you can um, support them by providing examples of what it should look like when they're finished or a checklist so they can check and make sure that they've done everything according to plan. So I have interpreted the template as the why, the what, and the how of your assignment. And I have taken that template and I've expanded it. So let's take a look at how we can do that. First, we... Um, can look at the basics. In my class, again, it's called how to learn with your mobile device. And so 
for one activity. The purpose of that activity is to use social technology like social networking sites or social bookmarks like Vigo to implement a learning strategy. Then the task is write a plan that outlines how you'll explore using social technology to improve your learning, the expectation that, is, that it'll be two hours over two weeks, and that the plan must include both a learning strategy that they've learned about and a specific technology. And then to help them succeed, I give them a rubric and a template to help them create their plans so they'll be successful in meeting all the criteria. So when you think about an assignment that, you're, that you have, how, what are the why, the what, and the how that you can share with students for that assignment? What is the purpose? What is the task you're asking them to complete? And what are some ways that you can help them increase their chances for success? And I'll echo Maureen, thanking Alex for putting the link to the transparent assignment template in the chat. And as a bonus, if you've downloaded handout number four for this particular workshop, I have the expanded transparent assignment template as page two, and you'll get to see uh, my twist on the, the great work that they've been doing at Tilt. You're welcome, Maureen. Okay, so as you all think about one of your assignments and the why, the what, and the how behind them, I'm gonna to move to the next part of this. How do we help students see meaningful connections between their lives and the work you're asking them to do? And I see Maureen's getting us started, explaining how each lesson can benefit their personal lives. Awesome, and read some good feedback, thank you. So if we expand the why of the transparent assignment template, we know already that they recommend making connections to the learning outcomes. That's academic in nature. But we can also, again, using those uh, bios that we ask students to create at the beginning of the semester, hey, we know what your workforce goals are. We know that you want to become an engineer. We know that you want to become a doctor. We know that you want to become a paralegal. And so whatever those are, we can include workforce connections when we say this is why this assignment is important. Also, personal. Hey, no matter what your academic goals are, no matter what your workforce um, goals are, this is going to give you an opportunity to work with people in a team. And those are skills that are used all throughout life, whether it's um, being an assistant coach for your child's uh, softball team, or whether it's um, being part of a team that's putting together a presentation for a big client. So when we look at some potential connections, again, we can see that we can expand what the traditional transparent assignment template includes to include not only the outcomes, but letting people know if what they're learning is a prerequisite for some future study or uh, some knowledge, skills, and attitudes that they're gonna gain, um, the relevant skills and knowledge or discipline-based problem-solving skills they'll gain, and then putting it in a personal context through either community or personal in interests. So for that same activity that I shared before, describing how you'll use a social technology to implement a learning strategy. I have them make specific connections. You should do this for one of your classes other than mine to learn something related to your work. Maybe it's a training situation that you've been asked to complete for work, or you've set a personal learning goal. You want to know how to cook Indian food. You want to know how to learn a language. You want to know how to play the guitar. So you're going to use a social technology and a learning strategy to do those things. So having students make a direct connection to something in their life uh, is something that I ask them to do every three weeks. So what do you do in, to 
increase the why. What, what do you do to help make the assignment meaningful to students? Do you use an academic uh, purpose, a workforce purpose, personal reasons? What are, what are some of the things? And I see you've been putting whys in there already. Simone says marketable skills that employers are looking for, calling that out so they know why it's important to complete that assignment. Susan says, why do they call the hardest skills the soft skills? Because life skills can be hard, absolutely. SUNY Coil Center, UNSDG connection. Gonna have to get a little help from you, SUNY Coil. I'm not quite sure what UNSDG stands for. Sustainable Development Goals, thank you. Maureen reminds students that college is the last times in their lives that their only job is to learn. So they need to make it as worthwhile to themselves as possible and ask, ask, ask. All right, as you all keep adding to the whys, I'm gonna move on to the what. So again, the template, uh, in its current form by Tilt Higher Ed, asks people to define the process and define the expectations of our assignments. And I added to that based on our equity work we've been doing, define the submission formats that they're allowed to use so that they know what's acceptable for your class. And this one's a short turnaround. What are some things that you include when you ask students to do an assignment, what does it entail? What are the, what's the process they have to complete? What are the expectations of what they'll generate? And what submission formats do you allow them to use? And while you generate those, we can see Caitlin added a why. Professional advancement requires new perspectives and affective growth, especially for the RN to BSN students, right? Brandon's what format parallels professional applications when possible, right? So asking them to do authentic assessment. Katie, formats offer assistance with converting to other formats from pages to Word and such, right? Katie, I'll throw out the challenge to you with the example I gave earlier. Is there a way for students on mobile devices to do that? Maureen, I use many lessons for my students in how to use Word, creating PDFs and using Google Docs so they can choose. That's not only a process, that's submission formats as well. Great job, Maureen. Double dip, Katie, we have Office 365 for all enrolled students. Back to that equity of content format. All right. So I'm gonna look at the last of our three, the why we saw, the what we saw, and now we're gonna cover the how. So when we think about cr criteria for success, the transparent assignment template starts us off with provide a rubric or a checklist provide examples of what student work should look like. And those are absolutely important. What I would add to that is what support are you willing to provide? For example, in my class, I offer what's called a virtual work sprint opportunity where students can log in at specific times. I usually, when a big assignment is due, I'll do four in one week, one in the morning before work, one on a different day during a lunch break, one uh, on a different day after work. And so students lo log in and they can spend half an hour out of that two hour block dedicated 
to working on an assignment for my class or assignment for another class or something else they have to get done. At the beginning of each half, half hour block, students state what their intentions are, and then they work for half an hour in quiet. And then at the end of that half hour, they state how well they did. And they say that working in community like that increases their accountability because they don't wanna be the only student in the room uh, surfing and looking for um, stuff to buy on Amazon or a pair of shoes. And so they find that they're more productive in these virtual work sprints um, because they are focused and they've got a clear goal in mind. We can also provide academic support links like, hey, this activity is gonna involve writing. Here's a link to the writing center. This activity is gonna involve uh, STEM problem solving. Here's a link to the tutoring center. This is a research project. Here's a link to the librarians that it can help you find a topic or find the materials you need. Also, what about non-academic support? Recognizing that our students are under a lot of anxiety and stress right now, hey, if this assignment or assessment is, is adding to your anxiety, here's a mindfulness practice website. Here's an app. Susan brings up food insecurity. Exactly. Um, here, here's a, a, where you can talk to one of the psychological counselors on campus for free. So letting students know that if they're feeling anxiety, there are resources to support them. And I, I recommend using the instructions for activities for this type of thing because students don't always refer back to the syllabus at a time when they need it. So I call this just in time help. And I even put a little box saying, what do you need to succeed for this activity? And then I just list tutorials for the technology if they still don't know how to use something or it's new to them or these academic and non-academic support links. So you can see I've described all this uh, verbally. Here it is on a slide. There are ways to provide instructor support beyond what TILT has shared, and then other academic support strategies uh, and non-academic support as well. And I see Jeremy is jumping in with campus counseling centers, yes. And a meditation uh, link for Insight Timer. So uh, because Jeremy got us kicked off, I'm gonna jump to that slide. How should students approach your assignment and get help for it? Do you give them checklists, rubrics, examples or templates, uh, links to support, links to resources? How do you support their success in completing your assignments? Try to supply exemplars, Caitlin says. I want to share these out with faculty and consider it a design suggestion in the future. Absolutely, Susan. And we're gonna create a chat summary that hopefully will be chock full of ideas that you all generated um, in addition to the resources that you have uh, in the folder. Maureen prompts students during the week to ask questions in discussion or email me directly and remind them I'm here to help them succeed. Nice. Kevin, another Kevin scaffolds large projects throughout the semester to avoid last minute scrambles and it breaks up the work. Kevin, I am a fan of talking about the psychology of the progress bar. And if you have an activity that's gonna take all semester to, to, to finish, if you're familiar with the psychology of the progress bar, humans are not motivated or satisfied until it reaches 75 or 80% complete. That's why when we watch that little bar go across the screen when we're downloading something big, you can feel an emotional change when we're at the last 20, 25%. And uh, if we take that to a semester, that means students won't feel motivated or satisfied until week 12 of the semester. But if we break things into small chunks and say, we're gonna do the first part of this big activity this week, you'll finish it this week, they get this constant cycle of affirmation that they're completing parts and feeling motivated to continue. All right, so 
Now you can see, and again, turn to page two of the part four handout and you'll see my expanded transparent assignment template that incorporates all these uh, things that come from the original as well as the, the new ones that I described in this workshop. So what did we do today? You probably don't believe that in just under 90 minutes, we went through four micro workshops and created all these ideas about how we can increase equity in our assignments through assessment, engagement, content review, and even the instructions. I'd like to save the last four or five minutes for any questions that you might have or more sharing that you <clears throat> wanna make sure your colleagues know practices, websites, anything that you think is important. Maureen, you're absolutely welcome. If you have, if any of you are people who like to do deeper dives, um, feel free to contact me, kkelly at sfsu.edu. But also I have the links to all the research from some of the different ideas that I um, shared. So I am going to stop sharing so that you can we can all see each other's faces. And then uh, you're welcome for all the thanks. Glad you found it useful. Um, I wanna thank the SUNY Online Summit team that constantly put on amazing events and this is no different. And they even took a gamble and had this crazy guy named Kevin Kelly do a workshop. Uh, so uh, thanks to Alex and, and everyone on the team. Uh, Especially want to thank Christine for being so attentive to the chat and popping the links to the materials and everything. But uh, I see lots of thank yous, but I want to make sure if anybody has any questions, again, I'll put my uh, email in the chat. You feel free to contact me directly as well. But it has been a pleasure to work with you all. Maureen, yes, I do have a book. Let me pull that up for you. It's called Advancing Online Teaching, Creating Equity-Based Digital Learning Environments. And if you use the code ETS30, you get 30% off and free shipping. If anyone has any questions, you can just unmute yourself. And if yeah. you want to open up your uh, your camera so we can see each other, that would be cool too. Um, we have a couple of minutes, and so please, uh, who has uh, who has a question? And if you don't have a question, are you at least inspired to go make one tweak? just one little thing to your assignments to make them more equitable. I usually close with questions and intentions. And I use hashtags, of course. Tom's gonna make a bunch of tweaks. Nice. Incremental Please. Do you think that, um in terms of, I feel like ADA compliance needs to include culture. And um, when we think about accessibility, and I just, I just wondered if that was ever, would ever happen. I just feel like it's as much of a, a thing that people have to figure out how to work through as all the other accessibility kinds of issues that you've brought up. And so, um, I know that some people are working towards like trying to create rubrics around that, but I just was curious. Um, this was a, a great workshop. Thank you. Sure. Well, so ADA typically focuses specifically on accessibility and the, you know, the people who are paying attention to details like that, I, I typically don't, but they, they look at things like section 508 of the rehabilitation act of whatever year that was. And so they, when they look at equity, I, I think accessibility is an equity issue, but I also think that equity is bigger. And so it might be out of scope 
for some people. What I do like is that if you're familiar with Universal Design for Learning, they have a new hashtag UDL rising where they are actually actively investigating how to think about equity as it aligns with UDL. And I sent them a note, I don't know if they're interested, but that I created my framework specifically to sit on top of the UDL framework as not an alternative, but just a complement, so that we can say, yeah, we're looking at our assignments, how students are going to express themselves, action and expression. So let's look at the equity issues as well as the, the UDL issues. And so uh, we can all push from the different parts of where we are to encourage people to think beyond where they began and the work they've all done, ADA, UDL, they're all important. But as you mentioned, it, it's we're learning every day, <laughs> there's more to learn. <laughs> so I forget if it was uh, Maureen who said, I tell students that it's no longer their only job to learn when they leave school, but uh, in some cases, we don't want them to forget that they need to continue learning. We're lifelong learners. Great question. Oh, look at that, Alex, phew, faster than a speeding typist. Got the UDL rising uh, link on there. Christine, if you have to go, no worries. All's good here. Um, thanks, uh, Kevin. Yeah, I saw that announced and immediately the, the UDL rising thing and immediately there's a, there's a link on one of those pages where you can uh, click to keep informed on what they're doing or even mm -hmm. uh, participate. Um, so yeah, I was very, very intrigued and interested because our next project with our Oscar rubric is to overlay it with a DEI, um, you know, set of lenses or practices or examples or, or whatever. So, um, so I'm in the midst of thinking about um, all of this from a, you know, faculty development course design perspective, so. So then I'm going to put a link in the chat for you, Alex. I worked with the Peralta Community College District to create the first ever online equity rubric that teachers can use to explore their course with an equity uh, framework in mind. And it's based on the research. So all of the criteria come from things that the research has identified are equity-based challenges that negatively impact student learning and equity-based interventions that positively impact student learning. And so we've actually been able to do a little research with one of our most recent cohorts and saw increases in retention, success, and even grade distribution, especially for learners who traditionally haven't been performing as well in online courses, Black and African-American students, Latinx, Hispanic students, first-generation students. And so we're, we know we're on to something, but it's preliminary. Like I said before, it's one study with 15 instructors and 300 plus students, but it's a start. And uh, as I said earlier, we need to keep doing the work. Yeah, I, was, I, I um, was familiar with that work. I didn't know that you were involved with the Peralta stuff. I need to talk with you Please. Um, online at some point because this is a collaborative effort with Cal State LA, um, the uh, California Virtual uh, Colleges and some other people mm -hmm. that are working on the annotations for um, uh, course quality, course, online course design. So mm -hmm. I'd like to talk with you about it. Please do. You know how to get a hold of me. Well, we are at uh, time. Um, I know we'd like to hang out here and continue to chat about um, all of these amazing and interesting topics. I just want to take a minute to thank um, everyone for, for joining and for your attention and your participation and engagement, and especially Kevin um, for leading this um, amazing workshop. It's been, um, you know, just very, very helpful, engaging, um, you know, relevant, highly relevant to, to all of us. And as you can see, we are a very uh, diverse and interested um, group, uh, very interested in these topics. So thank you so much, um, Kevin, for all of your um, effort and, and energy in, in putting on this uh, cool set of mini, lecture, mini uh, workshops. It was awesome. You bet. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Um, um, 
before everyone takes off for lunch or whatever you're going to do next, I just wanted to mention that we have our 13th annual unsession coming up at um, two o'clock. And if you haven't ever participated in that, um, I would really encourage you to come and, and hang out. And, and I would encourage you to sign up to share something cool that you are doing or your campus is doing or someone um, on your uh, campus is doing. And you have three minutes as an unsession and you have to sign up. Um, so I just put the link in the chat. And if you're interested in doing that, you can. If you just want to come and see what everyone else is doing, you can do that too. Um, and then later today, um, uh, later today, what are we doing? There is a uh, networking session for um, online student supports. And so um, it's an open informal networking session. Anyone is welcome regardless of your role or your areas of interest. We talk about all kinds of stuff. There's not any formal agenda and it's not recorded. It's just a way for us to interact and network and talk about things that are of interest to us and in, including the workshop shop or the other sessions that we heard today or yesterday or that are coming, uh, you know, sometime in, in this week. So thanks again, everyone. And I hope to see you at the UN session uh, at two o'clock. And again, thank you so much, Kevin. <laughs>